Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. You, Matthew chapter 5, beginning to read verse 13. Jesus is speaking. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavour? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I have not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment to teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, over the last few months, weeks, we've been seeing lots of strikes, lots of protests out on the streets, and you can tell a lot about people by the slogans that they chant when they're out marching. For example, those of us who are growing old, what do we want? Better memory. When do we want it? No. Sorry, want what? No. Or the quintessential British citizen. What do we want? Gradual change. When do we want it? In due course. Introverts. What do we want? Well, we don't know. When do we want it? Never. Students. What do we want? Six month holidays. When do we want it? Twice a year. Think about it. And of course, advertisers. What do we want? To sell more products. How will we get it? Lies, lies, lies. Well, back in Jesus' day, there were slogans too. They're not quite so obvious to us because they're not popular in our day and age. But one of them, the most popular in the Roman Empire, was peace and security. It's quoted by Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians. Amongst the Jews, there was one that stood out, no king but Yahweh, a slogan that expressed the deep desire that God would move to forgive his people's sins, to restore their nation, and to bring them freedom from all who would be oppressing them. And as is the case with slogans, there were some who went beyond saying them to trying to put them into practice. And that included Jesus. His version of the slogan went, repent for the kingdom is near. And through his teaching, his welcoming, miracle making and the like, <clears throat> Jesus was putting his slogan into practice. What's more, the message he was bringing and the lifestyle style he was advocating called into question all those around him who had their own ideas of what the kingdom of God would look like and how to bring it about. So what did Jesus mean by the kingdom of God? How was his message different from those around him? And what does it mean for us as his followers to live and work under his banner today? One thing that made Jesus' message unique then as now is that he placed himself squarely in the middle. Our faith cannot survive without Jesus being in the centre because our faith is not primarily a rule list or do's and don'ts or a philosophy of life. It's a person. Our passage is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which has rightly been described as Jesus' Kingdom Manifesto. But when you study this manifesto, you quickly realise that it's impossible to put into practice without Jesus. Through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying that the Kingdom is characterised by loving service of others, being right with God on the inside, and being willing to make the necessary personal sacrifices needed to be part of this Kingdom movement. He is also saying, you can't live this way without me at the centre of your lives. You can't please God without being in my company. 
You can't discover God's purpose for your lives and for the world without attending to my teaching. You can't become the person God wants you to be, the person you deep down inside want to be, without the life of Jesus filling and transforming you, enlivening and empowering you 24-7. This is why our parish motto, which is sometimes up on the screen, is much more than a slogan. It's a reminder that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Christ must be in the centre of the church, if the church is going to be at the centre of the community. In its context, Jesus' teaching here about being salt and light was his way of warning his fellow countrymen that they had lost sight of God's purposes for Israel. We tend to take salt and light to mean personal holiness and witness, and yes, it includes those things. But in Jesus' day, to be salt and light was to fulfill the purpose that God had given Israel, to be a light to the Gentiles, and to be a people who upheld all that was good in the context they found themselves, regardless of its source. Israel was instead pursuing a nationalistic agenda that would end in disaster, and did in AD 70, when uh, the Romans came and destroyed the city and the temple. Instead of being salt and light in the way that God wanted them to be, they were going down a path that would lead to national disaster and to darkness for all of Israel. So for us, that's a reminder that being church cannot be about being cut off from the community. We have to be salt in the community and light to the community. We need to live in the real world rather than just church world. To be salt means to live in the community in ways that applaud and support those community values that mirror kingdom values and to challenge those practices and pursuits that do not promote fairness or kindness or neighbourliness. Good neighbourliness, kindness, concern for those less well off ourselves, political agendas that promote fairness, inclusivity, the upholding of the dignity of others, while also challenging combat and combating injustice, self-centeredness, cruelty and greed, are all what it means to be salt. So saltiness means being embedded in the world in which we've been placed, not retreating from it out of some misguided piety. So activities like the Hamper Project, the fun days out associated with it, tea at two, volunteering and voting, they're all part of being salty. Being light means being unashamedly Christian as we're going about being salt. Being willing to point to Jesus rather than ourselves. And it means being quite clear that no earthly agenda, no matter how well-meaning, is ever going to be successful without Jesus guiding and providing. It's about telling our stories of the difference Jesus makes. Not just our stories of conversion, which for some of us might be some time ago, <laughs> but the tales that we can tell about Jesus being in our lives last week and what difference it makes to us and others. About, above all, being a people in whom the light of Christ can be seen and to make it clear that human happiness needs Jesus, that the good life without the God life is ultimately no life and that a life worth living in the here and now needs Jesus. What we're not peddling is a kind of pious pie in the sky when you die. Christianity is not about going to heaven when you die. Do you know that Jesus very rarely talks about the afterlife in those terms, if ever? Christianity is not about securing your ticket to heaven. It's about being a follower of Christ here and now. And so when Christ returns and the world is finally healed and made complete, this is where we'll be. I was speaking to somebody about this the other day and saying, imagine you're living in a reasonably comfortable house, but there are some things wrong with it and you're not quite secure and you feel a little bit, um, things aren't just the way they should be. And somebody says, let's go, let's take you on a holiday. So you leave your home for what you think is a couple of weeks and you're gone for a bit longer than that. And your holiday is marvellous. It's wonderful. And you wish it would go on forever, but you know you've got to go home. We all know that, don't we? When does it kick in in your holiday that you've got to go home? Usually for me, it's the middle of the second week. And so back you come, but to your astonishment and delight, the old home that you left is no longer there. Instead, a complete new dwelling has been erected in your absence. 
and it is the house of your dreams, with a garden of delights, and it is yours without cost, without mortgage, without any maintenance as such. It is yours. How would you feel? Anybody feel that's okay? <laughs> the thing is, I have just described what the real Christian teaching is about life after death, or rather life after life after death. We die, we leave our earthly habitation, and we go to be with Christ, which as Paul says is far better. But that's the holiday. When the dying thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus said, this day you will be with me in heaven? No. Paradise. And in Jewish thinking, paradise was the garden of delights, the holiday home that you went to to be with God after death. But the idea was always you'd return through resurrection to this world rebuilt. That's what I mean by coming back to the home that is no longer there because the old place has been taken down. But the new place, which is so much better, is going to be your forever home in this world, in this universe reconstructed, recreated, and made glorious. Now, do you see what I just did there? I told a story. Not a true story, a parable story about going on holiday, leaving a home behind and coming back, finding it rebuilt. But I've just said to you, in words that others might understand, a way of describing what we Christians believe about this life, the life to come, and why the two connect. This is what I mean about telling stories. Telling our Christian stories stories, our stories, um, because the things that have happened in our lives in which God was involved are stories that people can connect to. If you talk about being on the bus and suddenly a thought came into your head to phone your sister and you did so and found out that she was not very well and just needed you to visit, everybody would understand your sister, the bus, going to see her, illness, whatever. But what you put into your story is that God gave you that thought, or that's what you believe. Now, people might think, oh, maybe it's just a coincidence. That's fine. But they can't say you didn't, you know, your story isn't true because it's your story. And if we all got into the habit of telling our stories in this way, of looking for God in our lives, looking for God to shine his light into our stories, then we become the light that shares Christ with others through those stories. You don't have to be up here to be somebody who shares the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a theologian to be able to talk to others about how God is important to you. And you don't have to have all the answers either. I used to do something over the college which I called Roast the Rector, where I just went into a year 10 or year 9 class and said, ask me anything you like about the Christian faith, which they did. Some of them were silly, and some of them were really quite profound. And every so often they'd ask me a question I didn't know the answer. And I said so. Gosh, that's a good one. I don't think I know the answer to that. I'll go and find out. You're not kind of in an exam situation. You know, it's not off God when you're sharing your faith. You're not being examined by God, oh, you got that wrong. Oh, Polly, now you shouldn't have said that. You know, God delights when we are prepared to be the light that we are, not the light that we're not. So I want us to, to try and rethink, because we've often been told you are the light of the world. And in fact, it's the one of the I am command, one of the I am descriptions that Jesus delegates to us. We cannot say to people, I am the bread of life. We cannot say, I am the good shepherd. We cannot say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I hope not. I hope we never would. But we can say, I am the light of the world. Because Jesus has told me, that's what I am. And to shine light into people's spiritual darkness, you need to be able to talk about Jesus as a reality in your life. And to show others how you connect with Christ in your day-to-day -day activity and how he makes a difference to your ordinary life. Leave the theological debates to people like me. Just get out there and tell your stories. This means that we, the church, have to be like the Christmas pudding rather than the Christmas cake. Sometimes we're very tempted to be the Christmas cake. We think we must somehow look different and be more superior, more knowledgeable and more together than people outside. But we all know that within the church there are people who are broken. There are people who are doubting there are people who are scared. God doesn't want that, but that's where the people are in the church. People have to be who they are. But a Christmas cake is kind of like, you know, it's a kind of dark on the inside, but it's got this glorious shell of icing on the outside. In a sense, a Christmas cake is all show. 
until you cut into it. And of course, if you went into a shop and there's this magnificent Christmas cake in terms of its decoration, you might be tempted to go for that one than the more modest cake, which might actually be the better cake. But you don't know till you cut into it. I think rather than be Christmas cake, the church should be Christmas pudding. It looks ordinary, dark and raisinary. You know how Christmas pudding looks like. But the difference between a Christmas cake and a Christmas pudding is in the Christmas cake, the icing is on the outside. In the Christmas pudding, the brandy goes all the way through. And that is who we are to be, the Christmas pudding. Ordinary people on the outside, but with the brandy of the Spirit all the way through. And then, to change my analogy and to confuse you even further, the Christmas pudding is the modern equivalent of the burning bush. Moses would have seen bushes burning all the time. It happens in desert when creosote is the kind of natural extrusion of bushes. They catch fire, flash fires all the time. What he saw was a bush that was on fire but that was not burned up. That's what made the burning bush different from the normal burning bushes he might see on his daily life. We are such people. We are on fire but we're not consumed. We are zealous for God without being bitter at the brokenness of the world. We are filled with the joy as well as the sorrow of our faith. And we are authentic witnesses to Christ because we are on fire with love for God and for others and for ourselves. We're not consumed by our religion. We're set on fire by it. And that makes people come over to have a look. But of course, once Moses approaches the burning bush, once somebody comes to the flaming Christmas pudding, we've done our job. We then have to let that same spirit have the conversation that he needs to have with the person who's been attracted to Christ by us. That's what it means to be light. And we can do that every day of our life. We don't need a pulpit. We don't need a degree in theology. We don't need that. We just need to have Jesus on the inside and a willingness to talk about him on the out. This is true religion. When Jesus tells his hearers he's not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it, he's saying he's the only one who can. Because if you have a religion without Jesus, even Old Testament religion, you will have rules you cannot keep rather than a Redeemer who sets you free. But if you have this Redeemer, this Jesus, then the rules become the ways in which you live the kingdom life, enjoy the kingdom life, and bring others into the kingdom life. And all for the glory of God and the renewal of his creation. What do we want? God's kingdom to come. When do we want it? Today. Amen.